Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And when we last left the saga of Apple versus Epic, we were covering a very important deadline. If you haven't been following this story, when the court at the trial level made its initial decision in early September, it gave one important win to Epic, and that was to enjoin Apple from the use of its anti-steering provision, from preventing the developers that make games for its iOS ecosystem, from putting a link, a metadata button, a description in their app store description that would lead people off site so that they could sell their V-Bucks, gems, jewels, or what have you. As you could probably do the math in your head, from early September to early December, that 90-day time frame was almost up. In fact, it was to expire today, December 9th, 2021. But as of yesterday, the court decided to rule on Apple's motion. What did they say? Apple Inc. has moved to stay. That's pause. In part, the district court's September 10th, 2021 permanent injunction pending appeal. Apple's motion is granted. Now, if we didn't read any other part of this document, we would now know that the injunction is not going to proceed. It is not going to be enforced against Apple. They're not going to have to change the way they operate. They're not going to have to get rid of that portion of their developer guidelines that prevent quote unquote steering. But if you're interested in why the court made this decision, as I mentioned in my earlier video, it was always going to be on a kind of preliminary basis. It's a gut feel kind of thing. And because this injunction was actually seeking to change the world around us, it was going to make Apple do something new. There was always a fairly strong argument that Apple had that we should preserve the status quo because if Apple wins the case, then we would all feel very bad about putting upon Apple the fact that they shouldn't have had to change their systems because they ultimately won one or two years hence. Now, we wouldn't actually feel bad about that. Apple's a very big company. They can take care of themselves. But that's the notion in terms of equitable principles. And we find, as we look at what the court says here in a single paragraph, this is not going to be a two-hour long video, that the court was moved by that particular argument for the status quo and because of one other position that I thought was very powerful when Apple raised it in its documents themselves. The court says Apple has demonstrated at minimum that its appeal raises serious questions on the merits of the district court's determination that Epic Games failed to show Apple's conduct violated any antitrust laws, but did show that the same conduct violated California's unfair competition law. And then the court here quotes exactly what Apple put in its documentation in brief requesting this stay. And they quote, under California law, if the same conduct is alleged to be both an antitrust violation and an unfair business act or practice for the same reason, because it unreasonably restrains competition and harms the consumer, the determination that the conduct is not an unreasonable restraint of trade necessarily implies that the conduct is not unfair towards consumers. And I read that when I was looking at Apple's briefing documents. I thought, hmm, that's definitely something that the court could rule on. They quoted the Ninth Circuit's decision essentially back to itself. And clearly the Ninth Circuit at this level, the preliminary injunction stage, is convinced by their argument. They also note, as we did in virtual legality, that Apple has made a sufficient showing of irreparable harm, that there is no unwinding the clock if Apple is forced to change major portions of its systems across the country to do different things, whether that's auditing, changing their commission fees, doing something with links, setting new rules. It is something different. It is apart from that status quo. And that's why the court finishes the sentence by saying the remaining factors weigh in favor of staying part of the injunction and maintaining the status quo pending appeal. So there you have it. The day before the deadline was to come due, Apple gets its reprieve and now they won't have to do anything until the appeal is actually sorted out, which means looking at what the situation is now, I don't see a world in which the Ninth Circuit quoting this particular provision arrives at a place where the district court's decision is entirely upheld, that it's entirely the same when all is said and done. Now, there is a possibility of that. The court could come to a different determination after more fulsome deliberation, et cetera, et cetera. But if they are abiding by the standard they appear to have set forth themselves, that if you lose the antitrust case, you lose the California unfair competition law case, then what we're now looking at is effectively a binary outcome. Either Apple wins entirely, the injunction goes away forever, they win on all 10 counts, or the court could look at the facts presented, could look at what the district court found, think that the law was misapplied in this particular circumstance, and give Epic the win in its entirety. What I don't see happening is this kind of 
half victory or partial victory for Epic. It seems like it's all or nothing either direction now. And as we've talked about as part of this playlist, it is significantly more likely that Apple is going to win it all because Apple won the major considerations down the line, the first nine counts, the counts that were really tried. Apple pointed out in their document that in all honesty, neither Apple nor Epic talked about the anti-steering provisions all that much, except to respond to interjections by the judge and clearly sensing that direction from the judge, making some modifications to the cases they presented it. But in terms of briefing, in terms of what we've talked about, it was all about that Sherman Antitrust Act violation alleged by Epic and, of course, the related California laws, not the umbrella unfair competition law. So I think we're now in a position where the Ninth Circuit could overturn it, absolutely. But as we talked about, all other things being equal in a civil action, the district court is going to be presumed to remain in control of this decision absent some abrupt circumstances from the Ninth Circuit. Doesn't mean it can't happen, but it does mean it's much more likely that Apple is going to win. And now it's much more likely that Apple's going to win the whole thing. Either way, we're not going to know for a year or two, the Ninth Circuit, the busiest circuit in the country. And so that's a big win for Apple any way you slice it. Yes, I went there. The other component of this video that I talked about a couple of days ago was the fact that the Coalition for App Fairness tried to ask for permission to file an amicus curiae brief with the court. And somebody asked me what that means. That's a friend of the court brief. Uh, it's a brief that's filed by someone that's not actually a part of the litigation. They can't win damages. They can't get remedies. They aren't sitting there in front of the court, but they have an interest in which direction this goes. And certainly one of those interests is other developers who would either like to see Epic win or, yeah, I don't know that a lot of developers necessarily want to see Apple win on this. But either way, those developers can no longer file an amicus curiae brief, at least if they are connected with the Coalition for App Fairness, because as Apple told the court, and I think correctly, the Coalition for App Fairness is a front organization for Epic Games. They quoted some of the strategic documents that their marketing partners put forth. And I don't even think Epic would actually argue the point that much. It will be interesting to see whether or not other developers, other trade groups that might be under the control of Epic or under the control of Apple wind up having these kinds of motions filed against it. Generally speaking, the court wants to accept all amicus curiae briefs because more information is better in general, but they won't accept it if they actually have a connection with the party because that's fundamentally unfair for a party to get two or even three briefs against the other party's one. So the court's going to have to be looking at these because these are two giant companies. They both have trade associations associated with them. They both have small groups that they control functionally, if not literally. And so it'll be interesting to see if this becomes a kind of uh, cold or hot war where you file motions against amicus curiae briefs in a fairly unusual fashion. So we'll be watching that. That's really all I had for you today. I wanted to make sure you were updated on this information because I believe we're going to go into a bit of a hibernation and pause on this. There's going to be a long process of going through filing and doing various things with the appeals court. And the next time we're likely to talk about this is either with the party's various briefing documents, or if there is an oral hearing or something along those lines associated with that effort. Either way, we're talking months, not days on those kind of updates. So as of right now, for the foreseeable future, Apple's win against Epic is effectively total. I also want to give thanks, as I did in my previous video, to Florian Mueller, who puts these documents up. He did an entry on this, and I highly recommend it. I will link it in the description. Also want to give him a shout out for mentioning virtual legality. I think he makes a point here that I love, which is, as you know, if you've been here for a while, reasonable minds can differ. As I mentioned in that prior video, uh, Mr. Mueller and I disagree on certain fundamental aspects of how the law should be applied here, how Epic should maybe win or lose, how Apple should be treated. And yet you can still look at these things with clear eyes. You can still analyze them. Uh, and I think he's a great resource for that. And as I always recommend, get more information than just me or just anybody else. You want as much information as possible. I think his information is good. Even if I disagree with some of his conclusions, reasonable minds can differ and that makes the world a better and more exciting place. If you enjoy these talks, please consider supporting the channel at Patreon. This is a very, very short one. If you haven't watched a video in this space below, they're generally longer than this, but if you are interested in supporting us, please do check that out. Otherwise, just subscribing, telling your friends we're having these conversations that we now have a ridiculously long Epic versus Apple playlist that's going to go on hiatus for a short period, but much like your favorite Netflix series, we'll come back at an unknown time. And hey, we might just be binging it when that happens. 
If you caught this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it as a podcast, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.